Come right on in, everybody. We'll get started here in just a few moments. Seconds, I should say, just a few seconds. All righty, let's see here. There's still some people coming in. All right. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the first Friday lecture for the month of October. Today's speaker is Conrad Wieda, and his title is Rome on the Couch, the Psychology of Political Order. This first Friday lecture is supported by the class gift of the basic program graduating class of 2023. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on the Graham School YouTube channel if you wanna watch it later. Also, please be aware that you will not be able to unmute your microphones during the presentation as a courtesy to our speaker. You will be able to ask questions in the chat box. You can do so at any time during the presentation. Questions that you type in the chat box, I will keep track of, and then I will pose them to Conrad at the end of the lecture during our question and answer period. During the presentation itself, as I say, all will be muted except for our speaker. Conrad and I will be able to see your video, but we will not be able to hear you. So if you choose to leave your video on or to turn it off, it is at your discretion. Conrad's video will be spotlighted for the most part during the presentation. Consequently, the best way to view the lecture is to select speaker view instead of gallery view. Today's lecture is being sponsored by the basic program of liberal education for adults at the University of Chicago's Graham School. My name is Kendall Sharp, and I am the Cyril O'Hool Chair of the BASIC Program. Before I properly introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the BASIC Program, the Graham School, and our upcoming courses and events. You can find links to more information in the chat box. The BASIC Program is a four-year certificate program at the University of Chicago's Graham School of Continuing Studies. Graham offers an array of programs besides the BASIC Program, since 1946, we have offered our students a rigorous liberal arts curriculum based on the principle that there is no substitute for direct engagement with original thinkers in their original texts. Through focused discussion and close reading, our classes provide direct encounters with some of the great works of classical and Western culture in a dedicated community of adult learners led by experienced University of Chicago educated instructors. Registration for winter quarter 2024 courses will be open on October 18. Also, in news from our travel study program, dates are set for spring break in Greece and for the fortnight in Oxford for 2024. So save the dates and find the links in the chat. Our next First Friday lecture will happen on November 3, when our speaker will be basic program instructor David Shiner. David's title will be From Muthos to Logos. As I mentioned before, this presentation is being recorded. The recording will be available on the Graham School YouTube channel early next week. Our speaker today is Conrad Wieda. Conrad holds a BA in Classics from the University of Chicago and a PhD in Classics and from the Committee on Social Thought at Chicago. He has taught in the Social Sciences Core and Classical Languages in the college and is currently an instructor in classics at Loyola University, Chicago. Conrad's research interests are in Latin literature and Roman political thought. Conrad is preparing a manuscript named Horace Reads Virgil, Aesthetic Education and Moral Life, and has published on the text and reception of Horace and the political thought of Pliny the Younger. Now it is my pleasure to turn things over to Conrad. Conrad? Yes, um, thank you, Kendall, for the introduction, and uh, Zoe for sort of keeping this uh, this ship afloat. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you um, for coming today. Um, so, um, as as Kendall as Kendall said, um, I'm sort of working on these two projects on Latin literature and Roman political thought. Um, one on Horace's reading of Virgil as something that Horace does to sort of try to figure out what his um, moral life is going to look like after the Roman Republic. 
um, ends or reorganizes reorganizes itself or however you want to describe uh, what the Augustan settlement is. So that's the first project. And the second project is about, which is at a much less advanced stage, is it about how is about how people who are sort of close to the center of Roman politics and also interested in literature um, figure out what's going on in second century Rome. Um, so at this point, um, Rome is still, you know, referring to itself as um, res publica, um, but it's obvious to anyone involved that it doesn't work the same way as it did a couple hundred years before. So people, in some parts of their lives, it's like people pretend that things haven't changed, but then in other parts of their lives, they analyze what has changed about their political lives, but in a way that enables them to keep functioning in the new system, um, maybe in a way that they find sort of um, morally or sometimes aesthetically worthwhile. Um, so this lecture today is going to have sort of two parts. One is going to be about what the Romans thought their constitution was and um, kind of how how they saw themselves interacting with it when it was sort of clear that the range of the range of actions that were needed to kind of keep this empire going um and also to kind of motivate one's own career in the system that it had uh, this range of actions didn't sort of fit one to one there were, there was like a, a sort of mismatch or dissonance almost between what people were doing and thought they needed to do and the uh, set of terms they had to describe their political system. So the first part is going to be about this mismatch between the Roman constitution and sort of lived political experience. And um, then the second part of the lecture is going to explore um, what people in the second century thought was sort of worthwhile about participating in politics and how to explain um, to themselves what they were doing. Um, and I think I think a really interesting way of explaining this that I want to eventually elaborate more on if this ever turns into another book is um, to look at this through this sort of psychoanalytic framework of um, alienation and the other's desire. So that's going to come up in the second uh, half of the talk. Um, you can also imagine maybe um, that if Rome is on the couch, um, Rome's going to be looking up. And when the Romans look up, they see, well, a lot of red or ochre and um, sort of festoons and um, fake painted on molding um, on this nice, like in this nice ceiling painting um, from Aplantis uh, near the Bay of Naples. Um, so how the Romans have this term, um, SPQR, um, which goes back quite a long time as an acronym for, uh, what the Roman state is, uh, Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and Roman people, um, this um this acronym continues to be used on um manhole covers like uh this one that is well somewhere in rome today um if you've been uh, they're everywhere um so the state has um it has like two parts um that seem to exclude some number of like things in the state that aren't the senate or people but also indicate that really if you don't, if you have just a Senate, well, that's not a state, um, which is why it's a big problem in the early books of Livy's history of Rome when a bunch of the plebeian class just up and leaves the city. Um, but also the Romans seem to think that if you have a Senate without a people, uh, or a people without a Senate, uh, that that can't really be a state either. 
of course, um, the Roman state also at various the sort of big historical phases of the Roman state are defined by the Romans and also by us in terms not of what's going on with the Senate and people, but um, in terms of what's going on with kind of a third party to this Senate people relationship. Do they have a king, uh, like in the first book of Livy? Do they have two consuls or some other assortment of Republican magistrates, like through the rest of what we have of Livy's history? Or do they have um, what we call an emperor and what they'll sort of variously call a princeps or a Caesar, or in classical Latin pronunciation, Caesar? or um, Augustus, which is a name that gets invented for a guy whose name was originally Gaius Octavius. Subsequently, his name was Gaius Julius Caesar, son of the deified Gaius Julius Caesar, and then he gets this Augustus title, um, which everyone keeps using. So there are like these, and I'll keep returning in the course of this talk to kind of how this third term relates to the senate and people and what the what the reasons to try to ignore it are that romans have and what the reasons are that they have for you know trying to get into that position themselves um but yeah first um the the senate in the constitution is um maybe a little counterintuitive um looking from our perspective where we think okay the senate that is um, part of a legislature. Um, so Polybius, in his histories, um, devotes the sixth book out of what was 40-odd books total. Um, he devotes the sixth book to talking about how the Roman constitution works. And he says that Rome has a mixed constitution. It has a monarchical element. Uh, this is in the uh, late 3rd and early 2nd centuries BC. He says the Roman constitution has a an element of monarchy, which is these two consuls. It has an aristocratic element, which is the Senate, and it has a democratic element, which is the people. Um, how, um, so that's what these sort of three parts do, the three branches we might call them, do in Polybius's scheme. They're not though an executive branch a legislative branch and the judicial branch. Those functions are all sort of scrambled between the elements. Um, so Polybius says about the Senate, um, he prefaces this with a lengthy description of how the Senate sort of awards and oversees um, like basically infrastructure contracts. Uh, and then he says the Senate is also responsible for dispatching embassies to countries outside Italy either to settle differences, to offer advice, to impose demands, to receive submissions, or to declare war. And in the same way, whenever any foreign delegations arrive in Rome, it decides how they should be received and what answer should be given them. The Constitution might well appear to be completely aristocratic, as this is the impression which could prevails among many of the Greek states and of the kings of other countries, since the Senate handles almost all business of the state which concerns them. Um, later, um, the Senate starts passing a lot of resolutions that are called uh, Senatus Consultum Ultimum, or Final Decree of the Senate. Um, and these, these start to work sort of like laws. Um, and actually, it might, it seems like the Senate engaging in lawmaking in the Roman case, is a sign that something is not running smoothly in the Republic. When Polybius is writing, he thinks the Roman Republic is like, um, I believe the uh, the phrasing that the Penguin Classics translator of Polybius's history uses is that Polybius is writing about the Roman constitution in its prime. Um, so there's a Senate that Polybius sees conducting foreign policy, um, and because the Greeks um, sort of only are dealing with the Roman state in its foreign policy making capacities, um, they see this Senate doing it, conducting its business, and they think 
that Rome has an aristocratic constitution. So to go back to SPQR, um, SPQR does not include a monarch, Senate and people. It does um, include maybe an aristocracy as part of this thing that is the Roman state. Um, it also includes, though, people um, who, I mean, Rousseau, um, who you'll have encountered the social contract maybe in the, the modern tradition sequence of the basic program. Um, as, as, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau moves through the social contract, it becomes increasingly clear that he's interested in the Roman Republic as a potential model for um, a social contract that restores uh, the natural equality of human beings. Um, and including if, if the Roman Republic does that really, or if there's a sort of imaginary structure that does that, um, it's doing this through the inclusion of the Roman people in the constitution. Uh, so Polybius says about the Roman people, um, so we have the Senate that is conducting foreign policy and then actually still giving people the people a role in it, the way Polybius describes things. He says, it is the people alone who have the right to award both honors and punishments, the only bonds whereby kingdoms, states, and human society are held together. It is the people who bestow offices on those who deserve them. The people have the power to approve or reject laws, and most important of all, they deliberate and decide on questions of peace and war. Furthermore, on such as issues as the making of alliances, the termination of hostilities, and the making of treaties, it is the people who ratify or reject all of these. So this is the democratic element in the Roman constitution. Um, it's again, so a, a difference between you know the Roman Senate and what we're used to with senators are is that um Roman senators don't get elected to be senators for a particular term of time or representing a particular area or something. It's people who get elected to one or another magistracy in the Republican system and then enter the Senate after they've done that job or if uh, there, there seem to be other ways of joining the Senate, um, like Julius Caesar, for instance, just adds a bunch of new people um, because a bunch of families went extinct in the civil wars, but that's, again, after Polybius. Um, so the people are electing officials who eventually become senators. Um, so in a way, they they also, these, these magistrates are an executive branch. So the people is deciding who goes into the executive branch and who subsequently makes up the aristocratic element of the constitution. And um, also the people are engaging in legislation by approving or rejecting laws. And they seem to be making the final decisions about the foreign policy questions on which the Senate um, interacts with um, other states in the Mediterranean world. Um, so this may be the, the people's relationship to the Senate um, might be what Roos or is let me back up a little bit on Rousseau. So Rousseau thinks that the, the Republican form is constituted um, to sort of restore the natural equality that exists between human beings um, in the way that the Roman constitution defines the Roman people. Then Rousseau, so that's, Rousseau says that sovereignty rests in the people um, and that, um, there is then a government to sort of administer what 
sovereignty has, uh, or what the sovereign has generally willed. So there's the people that Rousseau thinks are correctly constituted in the Roman Republic, and then they have um, they have an aristocratic element who they elect to fulfill the functions of government. Mm. So here, if, if we're just looking at the Roman Republic through Rousseau's lens, um, it seems like we have we have a system that is just this Senate and people. Um, but how how do these magist how these magistrates actually work? Um, might make us suspect that this this sort of union between the Senate and people um, isn't explaining everything completely, um, or that it's even it's even creating some sort of illusion about how the system works. So even though um, the Romans have have an iconography that Rome continues to use of slapping the initials SPQR on everything. Um, their history has um, these phases that are distinguished um, not by new relations between the Senate and people, um, and it's not just like one continuous thing of the Senate and people, but you have a consistent thread of someone who is doing a role that's not the Senate's role or the people's role necessarily. So at the very beginning of Tacitus's Annals, he um, lays out sort of up to the starting point of the narrative that he's going to tell in the Annals, who is doing the thing that is not really the Senate's role in the Constitution or the people's role in the Constitution. Uh, he says that kings held the city of Rome from the beginning. Lucius Brutus established freedom in the consulate. Dictatorships were taken up from time to time. And neither the decimviral power lasted more than two years, nor the consular power of tribunes of the soldiers. There were uh, the the usurpations of Sulla and Cinna were not long, and then after that we get into Pompey, Julius Caesar, their alliance with Crassus is the first triumvirate, the dictatorship of Caesar, Augusta, uh, young Caesar or Octavian or Augustus's role in the second triumvirate, and then Augustus's eventual establishment of one-man rule after he has uh, dispensed with the guys he tried to share this triumvirate with. Um, so Tacitus doesn't see, Tacitus maybe thinks that if uh, freedom, libertas in Latin, is um, the thing that, or a, a thing that the Roman state defined as SQR, wants to have, he might not think that you can have that if there are uh, kings. Um, and it's it's important that um, at no point um, does the sort of Roman emperor figure identify himself as um, Rex or king in the period during and after the civil wars in the first century BC. Um, that might be incompatible with a lot of what people sort of say they want and may actually really want. Um, so they have kings at the start. Um, and then once they drive out the last king, um, Lucius Brutus, um, shown here in um, Jacques-Louis David's painting, The Lictors Bring to Brutus the Bodies of His Sons, um, establishes freedom and um he also devises this new magistr magistracy the consulate um which is going to do something in relation to the senate and people 
Um, so if you're reading Livy's History of Rome this quarter, um, you'll know that uh, the Senate and the people go all the way back to um, Romulus. So even though there are kings, they have senators. Um, it's just that under kings, the senators and the people don't necessarily have libertas like they do under a consulate. Um, there are, instead of one king, you have two consuls. Um, so they can sort of counteract each other if one wants to take total control. And uh, they also get elected on an annual basis, so they don't necessarily have too much time to entrench themselves. Um, Roman emperors will eventually like to get themselves elected consul a lot, although they also turn the consulate into a even a monthly office, so like the emperor might have been the consul in January with one other person, and then you have a series of what are called suffect consuls for the rest of the year. Um, in the case of Brutus, um, the Roman historians want us to take it pretty seriously that the consulate is a monarchical element in the Roman constitution, um, and it's it takes like really drastic action to um, establish it as kind of limited as a monarchical element, um, which is why the lictors in David's painting are bringing Brutus the bodies of his sons. Um, after Brutus establishes the Republic and becomes one of the first pair of consuls, um, his sons think that they are now in a good position to um, turn their father's consulate in the basis of a hereditary monarchy in their family. Um, Brutus discovers um, that there is this conspiracy and his sons are put to death, although not by him. Um, he stays home while this is happening. Um, David shows us Brutus, who... Um, has has a share in the constitution, um, sitting in the dark, looking away from his sons, um, Brutus's wife and daughters, who um, do not have a share in the constitution of the Roman Republic, um, are mourning the death of the sons. Um, the consulate... Um, and maybe part of what makes the Roman Republic attractive to Rousseau in the social contract is that the consulate is elected by um, the people. Um, it's not elected by the people sort of as one group picking something that the person who gets the most votes doesn't become consul. They have, they have a complicated system of block voting by these groups that are called centuries that include different numbers of people. And because eventually there were like too many people moving around a field in this process to like get each group's vote in the course of a day, they would often seem to have just stopped elections after the first day, which meant that the higher property group, um, or the higher property qualification groups had even more of a say than they would on the basis of um, the division of centuries alone. Um, so when Rousseau says that the people are electing the magistrates, he's actually he, he's looking at a system that builds in um, some level of inequality in sort of one's contribution to that decision. Um, Anyway, a question that the Romans don't quite resolve is sort of what, what ha if you have freedom and the consulate established together in a system where potentially all of the citizen men are involved in electing the consulate, um, the Romans don't quite answer the question of what, what a like major change in that decision-making process has on whether or not there continues to be freedom within the Roman state. So I mentioned earlier that the Roman Empire 
or sort of Rome after Augustus uh, continues to call itself a republic for sort of official purposes, and people continue talking about public affairs as res publica. Um, in fact, uh, Augustus himself, in a lengthy inscription called the Res Gestae of Augustus, where he sort of explains what he thinks were the important things he did um, in his career were, Augustus says that he, um, he says, uh, rem publicam in libertatem vindicavi, um, I, I vindicated the Republic into liberty, um, I restored the Republic to liberty. Um, so Augustus, like, really wants to emphasize that, um, it was it was civil war. It was Mark Antony in this weird triumvirate thing that was undermining freedom, maybe the consulate too. And that now now that they don't have under Augustus after in the twenties BC and following uh, the fact that there wasn't a civil war going on and that there was not a triumvirate meant that. Um, Libertas was back. Um, importantly, Augustus didn't generally, he didn't create a new magistracy for himself. Um, in fact, he um, the, the Senate would offer him new magistracies and he would turn them down. Of course, you can speculate on whether the Senate was offering him a new magistracy because that was what they actually wanted or whether he was just putting on a show. Um, Anyways, the, there there is sort of one really one explicit procedural change that Tacitus mentions a little further along um, in the annals um, that he doesn't he doesn't quite say what it means, uh, although he does kind of either report or imagine how people reacted to it. Um, when it happened. So the, the annals of Tacitus open in 14 AD, um, right after the death of Augustus. The book, the official or sort of full title of the book is Annals of Rome from the Death of Augustus. Um, Augustus dies in mysterious circumstances. Um, maybe um, his wife, um, Livia had a hand in it. Livia is the mother of Tiberius, who succeeds Augustus um, in being in charge of the Roman Empire. Um, explicitly, he takes on uh, what's called tribunician power. Um, but of course, there's no there's no like formal emperor title that kind of passes immediately when Augustus dies. Um, so Ti Tiberius um, takes over as the ruler of the Roman world, and um, Tacitus says that Tiberius gives a speech about how um, the Roman Empire is too much for him, um, and then some senators ask him, like, which part of the Roman Empire then, do you, or which part of the government do you want to be responsible for? And Tiberius says that, oh, but actually you can't, you can't divide up the government between different people. Um, so then after making it look like he doesn't want it, Tiberius is in charge. And Tiberius, um, before he, he spends most of his time in emperor as emperor um, outside of Rome, like he just leaves and never comes back and continues to sort of like govern um, by sending letters to the Senate and to other officials in Rome while he um, has sort of weird banquets in places like this grotto at Sperlonga on the coast of Italy, south of Rome. Um, while Tiberius is still in Rome, he uh, decides that the people um, sort of en masse are not going to continue electing consuls, praetors, quaestors, and so on every year. Um, Augustus sort of allowed this to continue, even though 
it was sort of the results seem to have been predetermined. Um, <clears throat> Tiberius decided that it was just going to be the Senate that was going to conduct the sort of pro forma elections. Um, and apparently at this point, um, no one really complained about what had happened. Um, I mean, it seems like the maybe a, an obvious reason for people not complaining is they knew that the results um, were had been predetermined for a while, so there wasn't much to complain about. Um, but still, um, Tacitus, Tacitus seems to want us to realize both that um, the the neither the substantive change that had already happened nor this formal change that Tiberius brought in um, produced a lot of dissatisfaction. Um, so we're now into the Roman Empire. Mm where the name the names of what's going on in the constitution are still the same um but the kind of content of what people are doing um has changed pretty radically um there's a there's a a book called Augustan Culture by a, scho a scholar named Karl Galinsky in which um, Galinsky says that uh, <clears throat> the vocabulary remained the same, um, but the grammar and syntax of Roman political life changed. Um, so people know what people under the Roman Empire, as it were, know what words to use, but they don't know how to form sentences using these words so they can't they can't sort of understand each other they may even not know what their rulers are doing to them and um particularly importantly if we're trying to sort of figure out um how how romans reacted to things like tiberius moving elections from the the campus martius which is like that sort of part of rome around the contemporary where the pantheon and the piazza navona are now um we're we're dealing it's like we're dealing with in some cases romans under the empire who um who can't quite express themselves um or at least tacitus Tacitus thinks that these people who are now um, subject to um, ignorance of public affairs as though someone else is, um, it's like these people, <clears throat> when these people speak, it's, it's, uh, they're they're producing something that's kind of gibberish in term as far as like speech that's actually going to lead to political action goes and tacitus so tacitus is aware of this um maybe plenty the younger is too and maybe some other range of second century authors are going to get themselves into a position where they they start to figure out how to analyze public affairs of course, they're writing, they're writing for their contemporaries who maybe they don't think understand what's actually going on. Um, they don't ever seem to want to just like rip the band-aid off and say what's really happening. Um maybe they give even signals that could be sort of clearer to posterity than their contemporaries. Um so we have there, there are a couple things that are sort of making the system or making the system sometimes continue to sort of hold it together, but other times 
to um, sort of blow up as in, well, the Pisonian conspiracy under Nero, um, as part of which the philosopher Seneca in the Rubens painting in this slide um, is forced to commit suicide or in this year of four emperors that happens after Nero. So sometimes, sometimes ignorance of public affairs as though there's someone else's um, makes things blow up. Other times it might kind of keep the system running on a more or less even keel. Um, I, I should also note this um, public affairs in when Tacitus says ignorance of public affairs, that's res publica. Someone else's is alienae. Um, so it's like the Republic has been alienated from these people, even though uh, if they have jobs in politics, they still they still need to um, they still need to like engage with res publica on a daily basis, but it's like the functionaries, the senators, and so on are doing, they're sort of doing someone else's political work rather than their own. Um, maybe you could say that they're not even, they're not participating in the system on a rational basis a lot of the time, but to the extent they do participate, um, like people people seek the consulship and people go to provinces as governors and people command armies. It's like they're they're doing all of this stuff out of uh what what Tacitus's Latin calls libido. Um sometimes they they have a libido that makes them want to agree with the emperor or i mean other times they hate the emperor and they'll especially if you read like gibbon's decline and fall of the roman empire people eventually start just declaring themselves emperor left and right or um once it becomes clear that like declaring yourself emperor is actually really dangerous we get a lot of um like legions on the roman frontiers um who are upset with one emperor declaring that their commander is the new emperor and then that guy will have to like lead this legion to take rome um because he's he can't he can't decline he can't say no i don't want to be emperor because his legion won't let him do that, but once he's accepted the purple, as it's called, uh, from his legion, he also can't um, sort of live safe from whoever the other claimant or claimants to the, the purple are. Um, so the emperor, the consuls get to wear a toga with at least some amount of purple on it, and emperors do this as sort of whether they're consul or for the sake of indicating whatever particular constitutional function they have. Um, okay, so we have these, these people who um, are engaging in political life. Um, they are alienated from political life. Um, and maybe trying to, some people might try to motivate themselves to engage in it by pretending to do things or imagining that they're doing something like what happened under the Roman Republic. Um, or they may sort of fully commit to operating in this imperial system. And in that case, um, they sort of it's maybe a different kind of alienation because they don't necessarily have the terminology. Um, Tacitus claims that something changes in the second century AD um, and that um, there have been within the Roman state two things that are dissociable. Um, the, the principate, um, which is a term that you can use to describe one man rule, and freedom or libertas, um, which 
you're able to have under a consulate. And then Tacitus says um, that once um, once Nerva and then the uh, the next ruler Trajan, here referred to as Nerva Trajan after Nerva adopts him, um, mix the or combine these two things that are dissociable. So now when Tacitus is writing um, first the Agricola, which is a biography of his father-in-law, and then the histories and the annals. Um, he says that they're they're under a principate, and in practical terms, maybe that's replaced the consulate. Um, but they have they have libertas again. Um, so then the the question um, that Tacitus doesn't engage with as much because he's he doesn't end up writing he doesn't write up he doesn't end up writing about his own times but the question is like what are you what are you what do you do to sort of enjoy your libertas under principatus if the kind of terms for the use of libertas in public life all sort of flow up to the consulate um, so Tacitus um, writes his biography of his father-in-law. Then he um, writes something about the Germans, and he also writes a little dialogue about um, whether oratory under the empire is better or worse than under the Republic. Then he writes the histories, which covered the year of four emperors, 68 AD, up to the assassination of Domitian, after which Nerva, um, combines freedom and the Principate. And um, in the opening of the histories, uh, Tacitus says that he hopes eventually to write something about his own time, but he never does that. He uh, writes the histories, and then he goes back to before the histories and writes about um, Roman affairs from the death of Augustus to the beginning of the year of four emperors. Uh, Pliny the Younger on the other hand, um, wrote was a, a friend of Tacitus. Um, although there seems it's it's clear, Pliny the Younger writes about Tacitus as his friend. Tacitus does not write anything that we have about Pliny the Younger. Um, what Pliny the Younger has left us, though, is this letter collection. Um, where he, among the things that happens in this letter collection are he provides advice and he also solicits advice um, to and from other people who are participating in political life under um, this guy, this emperor Trajan. Um, and I think by by looking at these letters, we can sort of see what what how how Pliny thinks a person might productively relate to the Republican past. Um, so I'm, I'll wrap up now um, by sort of pointing to a few things that happen in these letters. Um, we have this um, letter, book one, letter 23, is a letter that Pliny is writing to a younger man who is holding the office of tribune and um, has all this power over court proceedings that he's not really sure how to use. Um, because if he does the things that the office of tribunate was set up to do in the Republic, in this new context, it will appear that he's playing favorites. Um, so Pliny says that if you hold this office, you actually probably just shouldn't really do anything. Um, which um, holding a bunch of pretend offices um, doesn't seem like a particularly rewarding career. So um, what Pliny ends up doing instead, among other things, is... Um, reciting poetry and workshopping drafts of his speeches. Um, and he has 
many, he has many letters where he talks about um, this practice of recitation. Um, one though, there's there's one that's one of two letters that he writes to um, a, a lawyer called Titius Aristo, um, who Pliny says in yet another letter is sort of an example of old fashioned Republican virtue. Although paradoxically, Titius Aristo does not hold political office under the empire. Um, Pliny, maybe this guy Titius Aristo criticized Pliny for all of these poetry recitations. Um, but Pliny, Pliny points out in one of his letters to Aristo that um, this huge list of Republican statesmen, Cicero, Pollio, Messala, Hortensius, Brutus, and so on, and then also some of these emperors um, did poetry recitations, so that shouldn't be mutually exclusive, according to Pliny, with uh, political activity. And then Pliny says why he actually thinks it's um, it's important for him to do the to engage in these literary pursuits. And he says that um in the recitation he cult he and his interlocutors cultivate what he refers to as a uh, humanitas. Um this is striking that he refers here to humanitas and then writes or publishes another letter to Tidius Aristo that's ostensibly about like how to conduct a vote in a, a trial that the Senate has conducted. Um, in this case, in book eight, letter 14, the trial is of um, dozens or even hundreds of slaves and freedmen whose master has committed suicide and maybe there was foul play um, so on the precedent of actually a trial that gets reported in Tacitus's annals, um, some people think that the whole household should be put to death. Um, Pliny avoids this by some procedural maneuvering and then um, writes to Aristo asking whether this was like a correct procedure or not. Um, and... Pliny here sounds like he's trying to do, he's trying to come up with polit a, a, a way of doing politics that isn't just, um, I don't know, almost like lashing out on the basis of the example of Republican severity of, for instance, Brutus um, having his sons put to death. Um, but maybe as more, I don't know, we might in kind of contemporary terms say meeting people where they are. Um, and if this, if Pliny is actually, or if this, if this actually is sort of true, um, that second century politics in Rome is characterized by this humanitas, well, uh, this, this brings us to where I'll end for today which is Edward Gibbons, um, maybe ironic description of Roman life in the second century, or maybe I don't want to say ironic, but just there, there are two things going on here which Gibbon thinks are equally important. Um, one, he says that there are a lot of people living under a humane government. Um, but he also says, um, so this is, this is, he says, the, the period of the world in which the human race was most happy and prosperous. But he also says, without citing, a, so he doesn't need to necessarily cite a source for this. He has arguments elsewhere, and he's just venturing this opinion. But then, then he says something for which he cites no source um, and really sounds kind of like editorializing. He says that a just but melancholy reflection embittered, however, the noblest of human enjoyments of sort of ruling over this well-functioning society. Um, maybe, maybe the melancholy here is that um, these people there, there's no. There's not a system 
in place that like lets people put things into words and sort of train people reliably or acculturate them to preserve what Rome has landed on in the second century. So it's like some people, people are doing things um, where they, whatever is wrong with the vocabulary on the one hand and the grammar of syntax on, on the other in their political system, some people have solved a problem, but they can't, they can't seem to share that solution. Um, Gibbon sort of suggests that this is the fault of the Roman people and has a lot to do with kind of moral decline. Um, but maybe there are also sort of reasons in the political language um, that Rome in the second century has inherited from deep in its Republican past um, that produce um, this just but melancholy reflection um, on uh, the period in which Gibbon says the human race was most happy and prosperous. Um, so I'll end there and uh, I'm excited to see what uh, questions people have. Kendall, should I should I stop the screen share now? Uh, sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much, Conrad. Um, let me toggle over to uh, my document, and let me let me say, uh, everybody else uh, uh, in the audience, uh, it's not too late to add questions uh, to the chat. Um, so uh, type away. And Conrad, question number one comes from um, Stoic Dan. Stoic Dan in Orlando asks, the Stoics were one influence on Roman culture in general, hoping to train and guide young adults in building character. Can you comment on any school of philosophy that influenced Roman politics in a way that you find interesting? Um, I mean, I think, I think the, it seems like the Stoics might have um, the biggest influence. I mean, so... Epicureanism inspires people to um, leave politics. Um, Platonism and Aristotelianism are, um, well, people people know people in Rome often know a lot about both of these schools, um, but maybe because Plato's Republic is utopian and because Aristotle is so focused on how you do things in a Greek city that only has a few thousand people engaged in politics, they're um, maybe not, like, it's sort of harder to tell when someone kind of does something in Roman political life that is both noticeable and also evidently Platonist or Aristotelian. Um the, yeah, I think the the Stoic influence though might be there are there are problems with the way these Stoics act in politics. So on the one hand, yeah, we do there there seems to be some amount of evidence that there's like a Stoic opposition um, that kind of gets going under the Emperor Nero and is still there through um, Domitian, um, but. And then Marcus Aurelius is is the Stoic emperor, um, but it also it seems like what it, it seems like Stoics in politics don't they don't do a good job like making everyone be um, Stoic, um, and this is certainly something that like Gibbon picks up on writing the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And um, I had I had several more slides for today, um, but like one one thing I picked out to put on a slide, um, I guess I'll reshare the screen, um, is from this study of Gibbon, um, which I hope people can see. Zoom is sort of putting a bunch of stuff over it, but so Gibbon's idea, um, which maybe if you think about kind of what actually happens if Marcus Aurelius really is the Stoic emperor, but then passes power to his son, under whom things kind of fall apart. Um, Gibbon's perspective is that rather than doing, rather than having a philosophic school that's just teaching people to do 
the opposite of what the rest of the political community is doing you can you can search for um remedies to the problems in the problems themselves so one example of this um that sort of comes up like mm, maybe under under the influence of kind of how rome gets received in the enlightenment is something like ambition counteracting ambition in um federalist paper number 51 and, and Conrad, to, to follow up uh, uh, on the first part of your uh, answer, I'd like to draw a connection to the uh, the four year curriculum. You mentioned um, that uh, so in the four year curriculum, you know, in year three, students read uh, Lucretius. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so it, would you talk a little bit about what it was about Epicureanism, you know, which was, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 promulgated uh, in uh, Lucretius's work that uh, that would keep people out of uh, politics, uh, even yeah. under the, since Lucretius was Republican? Yeah, I mean, so the, the Epicurean life is supposed to be a life of um, kind of even consistent pleasure. Um, and pain is, well, something to be avoided in Epicurean life. So maybe, um, I mean, uh, political changes might, of course, cause like pretty widespread pain in a Roman or other context. Um, but yeah, Epicureans seem to think that um, actually being involved in politics is potentially too painful. So the Epicurean sage um, is supposed to find conditions where he's not vulnerable to the, the kinds of pains that get brought on um, by active political life. And Lucretius seems to be the person Lucretius is addressing in the nature of things. This guy Memmius um, might be like getting Lucretius's poem sort of in the wake of his own um, political scandal and failure. Thanks, Conrad. Um, we have one more question. Um, this one comes from um, Tom Iopolo. Uh Oh, two more questions. So the first one comes from uh, from Tom, who asks, uh, do we know if the caliber of men in the Senate, their, quote, probity, enlightenment, experience, close quote, and integrity, tended to decline as the imperial system got more entrenched? I don't, I don't think we know. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the imperial system, it, I take it, it, it entrenches itself extremely rapidly. Um, like there were, there were these sort of like you hear in the historical record about maybe, maybe after one or another emperor dies, there will be like 10 minutes where the Senate thinks maybe we can sort of keep this thing going without another person who gets this sort of mixture of offices and powers that they've been running it with. Um, and then under pressure from the legions or just their own inability to decide on an alternative, um, they keep going with this imperial system. Um, Yeah, I don't I don't think there's there I mean we don't have sort of records of who all of the senators are. Um the historical record does seem to indicate that you had people who were making and making a sense nope. to govern well. Um sort of Yes, at, good. How are you? What do we need? Um I think there Conrad, I'll uh, I'll intervene. Uh, and we also, I mean, there are also lots of, especially um, in sort of the like Stoic accounts or the accounts that the Stoics want us to have of Roman history, um, there seem to be a bunch of exemplary uh, senators, um, even under really bad emperors. Um, yeah, so hopefully, I mean, I guess the answer is that, like, either we don't know when the Senate seems to have, like, been a consistently mixed bag. And uh, let's see here. Hang on a second as I'm mousing around. Let's see here. So the next question, uh, let's see, we had a couple come in. 
Okay, we have Ray Lucchese is next. Oh, and it's a two-parter. Okay, hang on. Just a second, Ray. Ray is eloquent. Practicing eloquentia. Um, Ray, Luch Ray Lucchese asks, the lack of political character in the people and maybe the Senate that is evident in the empire period is a characteristic of other monarchical societies. The challenge is that in the case of Rome, it went from more freedom via Senate and people and consuls sharing power to an emperor pretty much allowing the Senate to do what he wants. Um, and perhaps that means a two, uh, 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 the Senate allowing the emperor to do what he wants. Um, is there some sort of parallel to what's happening today in USA as the president and executive branch figure out how to govern by itself through regulations rather than waiting for legislation from Congress? Is the rapidity of the imperial system recreating itself an indication of the failure of the Senate people to the Senate hyphen people uh, to properly govern Roman society at the time. Um, yeah, I think I think the answer to the second part is um, probably yes, with the sort of caveat that um, it it takes quite a while before they figure out a way to get emperors who are um, like actually interested in governing and not um insane um and the thing they, they end up sort of figuring out this so the the so-called five good emperors are all adopted um well so one is picked by the senate and the next four are adopted by their predecessor um and that kind of works for this thing that is functionally a monarchy but isn't really a monarchy um yeah, but then what? So the question is about the parallels to now and a, a lack of political character. Um, I um, hmm. I don't know if there's a parallel. I mean, the the way the way the people lack political character, I think, is it, it seems to be different, even sort of like from one stage of Roman history to the next, because you get really you get people whose ambitions in the Republic sort of overwhelm the system um, because they, I mean, so part of it is sort of people who are engaging in politics like Caesar or Pompey accumulate these just like almost unfathomable, unfathomable amounts of wealth that then sort of cause them to like really crowd out other people's participation. Maybe that okay maybe maybe you can argue that there are there are kind of parallels between that and money in politics now um but i mean just sort of caesar getting a bunch of wealth in gaul and then having this unstoppable army um that can cause the state to be completely transformed maybe i don't know if that quite has a parallel and then then people under yeah people adjust to life under the empire and they stop being so overwhelmingly ambitious and the system gets kind of subtle changes that make it harder for someone to do like what Julius Caesar did in the 50s and early 40s BC um although yeah i mean maybe i take it now the executive branch if the executive branch now is doing a lot um, because of legislative dysfunction, um, the Roman Empire, like, I guess Rome, Rome has a really violent way of solving legislative dysfunction, which is that, I mean, they, they have, if they have a period of legislative dysfunction, I guess where you see that is in like the, the late second, early first centuries BC, um, but the legislative dysfunction then sort of blows up into civil wars between groups that have different positions on the things that aren't able to get legislated successfully. Um, so then when they when they actually go to this system of one man rule, um, they um, the problem of legislative dysfunction has sort of it, it's kind of in the past. Um, and lawmaking, imperial legislation works. I mean, it even works in different ways 
in different places. So I don't, I don't, if, if our executive branch is responding to legislative dysfunction sort of in real time, I actually think it may not have a great deal in common with say like the imperial bureaucracy under like Hadrian. Thanks, Conrad. And a uh, final question comes from uh, Donna Corey, who asks, is Pliny's use of poetry, while he comments on political power, uh, on the political power structure, um, is it a form of protection against retribution, or perhaps being, quote, canceled by his influencers? By uh, the Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think Pliny... Um, yeah, so if Pliny, the idea might be that if Pliny were sort of outspoken, um, his political standing might be much more precarious. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we're, I mean, it's a little hard to tell what Pliny thinks would happen if he were really outspoken in his own time, because he tells us that sort of like everything is fine and there's really not much to be outspoken about, um, which may or may not be true. Um, he does report on people who were outspoken under Domitian who is an emperor who's supposed to have been um, really bad, uh, who got replaced by Nerva. Um, and we hear about outspoken opponents of Domitian who uh, had to commit suicide or who had to sort of drastically cut back on their public profile. Um, and Pliny sometimes sort of reports on their recent deaths um, when he's writing his letters. Um, and he also seems to be engaged in kind of some, some legal battles and jockeying for position with, the, um, with supporters of Domitian's regime. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe poetry is... For Pliny, it's it's an alternative to a certain kind of um, outspoken action, although a little clearer sort of why it it's a little clearer why it would be that in the period that Pliny sort of has lived through but isn't in when he's writing all these letters. Well, thank you, Conrad. Uh, huh? and um, let's see here. I am now, we have a custom, uh, uh where I will, um, allow ev everyone in the audience to unmute. There we are. And, uh, so they can applaud. So, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, and. So um, uh, uh, let's see here. So it's Friday. We have classes tomorrow and a symposium. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in class. Thanks again, Conrad and everyone. See some of you next couple of days. Bye-bye.